Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here today, and uh, I really appreciate your, your taking time out of your very busy schedule to come out and uh, learn and uh, listen. Um, so I want to I start, you, uh, start us out with a very simple story um, about a bank, uh, about a man who walks into a bank. Uh, there was this uh, very uh, older, distinguished-looking gentleman who uh, walks into a bank and goes up to a teller with a bunch of papers and says, uh, I want to make this transaction. Uh, the teller, let's call her Sally, uh, looks up to this uh, person and says, uh, this looks like a very complicated transaction and the person who can handle this uh, is not here today. So uh, can you come back some other time? And uh, this gentleman, a little bit frustrated, says, uh, how about your manager? You know, can you get your manager to make this transaction for me? And then Sally says, it's the manager I was talking about. You know, he's the one who is not here today. And um, so can you come back some other time? Uh, the man was a bit frustrated, but he understood and said, all right, uh, I'll come back. Uh, here's my parking ticket. Could you please validate this parking ticket? And, uh, you know, I'll come back some other time. Sally says, uh, I'm sorry, sir, I, I cannot validate this ticket. And the man asks, why? Sally says, uh, I can only validate the parking ticket for people who are going to be performing business with the bank. <laughs> so the man says, uh, what the hell, I'm, I'm trying to do business with you, it's your guy who's not here, and you wouldn't validate my ticket, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, Sally says, hey, you know what, rules are rules, and I didn't make those rules, so, you know, if you want me to validate your ticket, you'll have to perform a transaction. The man looks up and says, okay, fine, I will perform a transaction. Go ahead and close all my bank accounts immediately. This man, his name was John Akers. He is the former president and CEO of IBM. And he walked out with $1.5 million that day from that bank account. Wow. I look at that and I'm like, this is not that one Sally, one bad employee having a bad day. This is a cultural problem. I mean, what, what, uh, yeah, you know, you can totally understand that the bank has to have policies and rules. Maybe the culture of this bank was about following rules and following protocol, but that culture cost that bank $1.5 million in deposit that was lost within 15 minutes. So you gotta question, what is this culture stuff? You know, I know many of you guys are thinking, you know, I, I, I know the answer to this one. You know, I've got this uh, Margarita Mondays, you know, I've, uh, I've got this Bring My Dog to Work Tuesdays, you know, you know, and I've got uh, free food that we give out, you know, we even have a ping pong table, you know, so, and then we round up the week with uh, free Friday kegerators, so, you know, I've got this. Wrong. You couldn't be more wrong. All right, let's try it one more time, you know, and then Perhaps you're thinking, you know, what about all those great uh, posters, you know, with those nice sounding words you plastered all over the office, like uh, the, the posters that had written the word teamwork and commitment and persistence. And you even asked your uh, marketing team to put together all kinds of tchotchkes with uh, hats and mugs and you let your people take that home with you, you know. So that's got to do it, right? I mean, culture is far more than that. If that was the case, Walmart did not beat Kmart on low-cost strategy. American Airlines and Delta, with all their people and power and resources, are unable to duplicate and copy the, co the effective and efficient culture or business model of Southwest. There is something more here. There's something more. And that is the culture I'm talking about.
culture to me is like a filter. It is far more than the perks, what we discussed earlier. Those stuff is perks. They're of course nice perks. Who doesn't like free beer, right? I mean, that's, however, culture transcends those things. To me and my company, Go Ecart, it's about the filter that we use to hire people. It's the same filter that we use to fire people who do not live with those culture. And it's the same filter we use to reward and to promote people. And it's, I didn't know any of this stuff, right? I, I started my business uh, in my dorm room at the University of Bridgeport in 2000. I had no idea what I was doing. This is one of the greatest learning experiences I've come up with and spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, what, what is this culture stuff, you know? I mean, culture, the word thro gets thrown around uh, very, very loosely. And, uh, you know, everybody says they've got this great culture. But honestly, you know, most of the cultural statements or core values that you see written out everywhere is a bunch of bullshit, you know? I mean, Enron had this big marble stone wall with the words honesty and integrity etched right outside their lobby in their headquarters. And not too long later, most of the executives ended up in jail for fraud, you know? So it is one thing that is so vital. If you're a leader or a manager, I would argue that preserving and cultivating the culture of your organization is your number one job because strategy can be duplicated. Culture is extremely hard to copy. So how do we go about building this uh, culture thing, right? I mean, this is, uh, now that's the hard question. That's the hard part, you know? So I've got, I've got a very uh, simple and easy three-point plan that I can share with you that you'll get you to creating a kick-ass culture that you can take home with you. Um, I'm sorry, that, that, that was a lie. Uh, uh, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's damn freaking hard. If anybody tells you creating culture is easy, they are flat out lying. You know. So, number one, step one is, in order to do something, you need to know what you're going to do, right? So step one is just figuring out what is that stuff that you really care about. And believe me, that's harder than it looks or harder than it sounds. You know, you have to be brutally honest about the stuff that you truly care about. And we often hear things like, uh, what should our culture be, you know? It is not about what your culture should be. You don't create culture. You actually discover culture, you know? Culture is the set of qualities that, uh, you know, that you value. You know, as a founder of your company, shouldn't the company be a reflection of your best qualities? I mean, that's one place you have the ultimate right of, and you get to be the sole determinant of what that culture ought to be. The worst way, or not so great way, of going out and figuring out what your culture should be, like, hey guys, let's get together in a room and let's call this all hands meeting and let's, um, let's vote on what should our culture be. I mean, that is not what a culture comes from. Culture is the set of values that you truly care. And culture should be established even before you hire your first person. Ideally, it's about going and discovering your strengths, figuring out uh, what are the things that you really care about, and then being very honest in prioritizing them and removing any fluff that is, and, and being absolutely authentic with yourself. Um, th that is absolutely the number one way that I would suggest that, uh, um, you know, and, and 
we, we all are always um, aspired and uh, impressed and inspired by other companies and people you know you're probably uh, looking at Apple and Google and they're like wow you know I want to be like them you know but you don't want to live their culture you're not trying to create their culture you're trying to create your own culture but so if there is a person out there that you truly admire because they're a badass employee and so go figure out what makes them badass and what exactly do you like about them so that you can incorporate those. And those what I call are the aspirational values. Uh, it's good to have them. Just be careful, don't put too many aspirational values, otherwise you yourself might not be a cultural fit for your own company. You know. You know. So, number, now that you've figured out uh, what values you care about, meaning what you truly care, step two is Hiring people that care about the same things you do. It's not about good people or bad people, good culture or bad culture. It's not about trying to change people's personalities. Because I don't believe you can change uh, people how they behave and especially their attitude. And uh, frankly, I don't believe in changing that. I don't know how to make a... Um, you know, a very aggressive person, passive. I don't know how to take a detail-oriented person and, uh, you know, make them, uh, or analytical person and make them a people person. And frankly, I don't want to do that because, you know, that would be doing disservice to them. Putting people in the wrong place is doing disservice to those people. So at GoEcart, what we do is we use a very simple personality assessment tool called Predictive Index. It's like a 10 minute, uh, 10 minute online survey that uh, people get to fill out, uh, all the people that apply for positions at GoEcart, and we get to learn a lot about that person so that we're trying to match their native personality to what is demanded in the position that they will be working on, as opposed to forcing them to adapt. And what I find is the interviewing process in corporate America is highly broken. You know, um, all of us that managers are trained to interview people on skill set. So, you know, if you're going to hire a bookkeeper, you can ask them quick book questions, you can ask all that questions, but we seldom interview for cultural fit. You know, and that's a big opportunity for everyone in this room because that's where there's a huge opportunity for us to find the right people who are going to be right for us. There are no good people or bad people, good culture or bad culture. And I'm really fascinated by the way how Southwest does uh, tr uh, recruitment for their flight attendants. Um, so what they do is they'll put up an ad uh, in the newspaper and they uh, get a ton of resumes and what they will do is they'll bring in people by the hordes and put them in a room just like this. They'll invite about 60 to 80 people and they'll do a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews. They'll do group interviews. And uh, one of the group interviewing technique uh, that they use is they'll put people in groups just like this in round tables of uh, eight people or so. And uh, they will ask each person to tell them uh, the most embarrassing moment that they ever had, a story to narrate what were the most embarrassing moment and each person has to go around the room, uh, around the circle. So you're probably thinking, what are they trying to figure out, you know? They're probably trying to figure out, uh, you know, how does this person handle adversity? Or uh, how does this person, uh, you know, um, are they an easygoing person that uh, uh, doesn't take life too seriously because it goes with the Southwest culture? And as the person is relating their most embarrassing story, what you'll notice is the interviewer is not paying any attention to the person who is speaking. That interviewer is simply looking at the faces of all the people around the table. And that interviewer is looking for empathy. That interviewer is looking for how the facial expressions of these people change as the person is narrating their most embarrassing story. And that's very hard to fake because Southwest has learned that they can teach ordinary people the rules of aircraft safety, how to wheel the cart, hand out peanuts and water, but what they cannot do 
is teach them how to fake a reaction when they have to inform the passenger that their flight just got canceled. And somebody is going to miss their grandfather's funeral or somebody is going to miss their daughter's wedding. At that point, it's those passengers are simply looking for a shoulder to cry on. And that is something you can't fake. So if you don't figure out what's that thing that's supremely important to you and find out a way to measure for it, you, you're not going to find the people that truly matter for your business. It's a great opportunity. And finally, step three is very simple. All you have to do is pay very close attention to steps one and two, which is uh, figure out what you really care about and then figure, uh, hire the people that care about the same things as you do. And it's actually purely physics because it is literally uh, the second law of thermodynamics. Um, to paraphrase it, if things are left alone, they will degrade to crap automatically, including culture. So, if you care about the things that you really care about, you must reinforce that every day. Otherwise, your culture, even if you started out with a semi-decent culture, it will degrade to crap. Because I believe, that's my opinion, and I believe in it. Um, it's very important to figure out that are you walking the talk? Are you and your people living up to the core values that you've set out in step one? You know, are you and your people have the courage to question the actions that are inconsistent with those values? That's the hard stuff. That is, has been profoundly hard for me as a leader to stay that disciplined because that is what you get challenged every day. It's not the food that you eat, it's what you digest that makes, it, makes you strong. It's not what you read, it's what you remember is what makes you learn it. And it's not what you teach, it's what you practice is what wins your integrity. So, when your people get off track, do you have the courage to slap their wrist, put them back in line? You know, but it's also about rewarding and it's also about giving them a pat on the back when, when they're doing the right thing. So I firmly believe in catching people doing the right things. It's very counterintuitive and perhaps paradoxical because people think that catching, you always try to catch people doing, making mistakes. But when I catch the people doing the right things, I have a true opportunity to give them genuine appraise and genuine praise that they trust and believe that's authentic. So um, it's, it doesn't have to be negative, but you have to reinforce the values that you really care about. So I want to bring us back um, uh, to the original story, the bank story that I told you about. Was Sally wrong for not following the company culture, or was the bank wrong for, um, for having uh, value about uh, um, having uh, adherence to strict rules and policies? No, because that's how the bank is supposed to protect against fraud and making sure your financials are accurate. So where did, what, did, what went wrong? I would argue that Sally was missing context. Bank was right, but nobody told Sally that not to apply that same rule of, of following rules literally to validating parking as it was to applying that to the transaction that she was going to commit. So. Without context, none of this matters. It's all big abstract thing unless you bring it home and, and uh, provide context to your people. And as a leader, as a manager, it's your job to provide context. So thank you very much for listening and have a great rest of the day.